Hey everybody, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games. I am Harry, and before we go any further, please don't forget to hit the like button down below and subscribe to our channel if you're interested in some more board game related content. Today, I will be discussing my top 10 Bruno Cathala designs. For all those who've watched the channel or who watched my top 10 board game designers of all time, you would know that Bruno Cathala is very highly ranked on my top 10 game designers. If you want to know exactly where he ranks, check out the video on the link down below to see where he ranks and who the other nine of my favorite board game designers are. But today we're going to be focusing on him, zeroing in on him, kind of like we did last week with Reiner Knizia. Check out that list as well. And the thing about Bruno Cathala is that I have not played nearly as many games of his as I've played of um, Reiner Knizia. As a matter of fact, I am just barely able to make a top 10 list. I own, I think I own like 11 or 12 of his games, but up till now, I've only played 10 of them. And I couldn't wait to play the other two before I could make this list because I was excited to talk about many of those games. Now, keep that in mind, some of the games on the bottom half of the list, well, not so many of them, but a few of them, I might not be as excited about but they're just there to fill the 10. So, speaking of, let's start with our number 10 for today, which is a Game of Thrones, Hand of the King. And this is a small game, and Fantasy Flight is published by Fantasy Flight Games. And this, Fantasy Flight has a few of these other small box games. And one in mind that I bought was one by Michael Renek, which is called Journey to Mordor. And it's basically these very small um short games that don't take up a lot of table space maybe it's like an answer to the tiny epic uh series actually tiny epic series even though they're small in box they take up a lot of space but the point is small boxes don't take up a lot of space but they're very simple and perhaps too simple of games it sounds like these are games that these designers maybe had in their back pocket and you know Fantasy Flight said, well, we're not going to invest a lot of money in them because they're probably not going to sell. Let's just make it a nice, small, compact, you know, presentation and see if a few people are willing to spend nine, ten bucks for a game, right? And I will say this, I do like this more than the Journey to Mordor game. This is a simple game where uh, it's hard to explain, but you're you're basically, you create a grid of, of cards with the different characters from the different houses of Games of Thrones and I probably would like this game a little bit more if I was a Game of Thrones fan I've been curious about the Game of Thrones IP but I've never really invested into watching it so you've got all the different characters and you also have this one special character I don't remember his name again I don't know much about Game of Thrones and this one card you're moving um him along the grid of cards to and and wherever you move him to um you get to like grab the card that you move him to and you can only move him in a straight line, either horizontally or vertically. And then you capture that card. And then every time you have the majority in one of the like eight different families, you get like a banner, which represents that family. And that's basically like a victory point. And you're going through and going through. And basically, it's very abstracted. And the game ends when there's no legal move left, kind of like chess. Um, even though chess could also end through a checkmate. When there's no legal move, and whoever has the most banners from the different families is the winner. So you might have something like five to three or four to three, and there might be a tie. You might have the same amount of banners. And if you do, the tiebreaker goes to the person who owned the most, the banner for the most valuable family, because each of the different families have a different rank of value. And they also have a different amount of members of their family that are represented by the cards on the grid. Very simple game, not, not much to talk about, but it was okay. It, I don't mind it for like a, a filler for the occasional game. But again, it was only good enough to make it to my number 10. And now I start liking the games a little bit more. My number 9 Bruno Cathala game is King Domino. And this game is the Spiel des Jahres winner for 2017. Simple gateway game. I think if I ever had to recommend a gateway game to people, it would actually probably be this. Even above games like Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride, it would be this because it's so simple and so short. Like, the game could literally take, like, 20 minutes, while Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride can be, like, 45-minute experiences, which for some non-gamers is, like, an eternity. This game could quickly end in, like, 20 minutes, maybe 25. The presentation is beautiful. The artwork is beautiful. The components are beautiful. And the mechanisms are so simple. And at the same time, 
pretty neat. You know, it has a very familiar concept to people, which is the concept of matching dominoes. Except instead of matching pips and numbers on a domino, you're matching, you know, similar terrain types. Um, and at the same time, it has some neat mechanisms that appeal to the gamer, although it's in a very light package. It's almost like a snack to a gamer's heavy meal. Uh, I've been playing lately, my wife and I have been playing with the Giants expansion, which adds a few wrinkles to the game. I'm not going to say it adds complexity per se, but it adds a few more potential decisions. And it's always cool to have a few more decisions in what is a very light game. Like this game, I still haven't played Queen Domino. I got to get that game, purchase it, and get it to the table because I've heard, I've heard good things about it. For those who like King Domino, they tend to usually love Queen Domino. So I am curious about getting that. So this is my number nine Bruno Cathala game of all time. King Domino. And now we move on to my number 8 Bruna Cathala game of all time. And it's actually King Domino Duel. I like this two-player only roll and write version of King Domino. I find it to be a more compelling experience than King Domino. This does not... While I would still say that this has a gateway feel to it where non-gamers could play it because... You know, a non-gamer might be familiar with a game like Yahtzee or some similar concept. But at the same time, I feel like it has a higher ceiling than a game like King Domino. Because this game can get pretty intricate. And the more you play, the more experienced you become as a player, the better you are at manipulating the grid of spaces that you're trying to like pencil in. And, and, you, ch and you get better at just the spatial orientation of your different tiles. And your tiles aren't literal tiles. They're actually... You know, you, you roll the dice, you draft them, your players take turn drafting them. And the two dice that you end up drafting basically form your abstracted, you know, um, domino that you pencil in and actually draw in yourself. So for anybody who likes arts and crafts and, and that kind of thing or art and drawing, like this can be a very fun, therapeutic, zen-like experience. My wife likes it for the zen-like experience. Me, I like it for the puzzle and the challenge of trying to get your grid, kind of like in King Domino, you want to like basically utilize every space ideally. You don't want to trap yourself or block yourself off from a spot because it feels like a waste. Um, and then you end up having turns in the future where you don't even do anything because you can't draft anything because there's no possible place for you to place something down. But I like the challenge of trying to figure that out and just trying to maximize your points overall. This game um, is so close to me saying I love it. I like it a lot and maybe with a few more plays, I might be able to use the L word. Not the like word, but the love word. So now let's move on to my number seven Bruna Cathala game of all time. And it's Jamaica. And this, as many of Bruna Cathala's designs, is a co-design. He designs this with two other designers. And I'm not even sure if he had the most input in this game. But at the end of the day, his name is on the credits. So I'm going to give him some merit for that. And Jamaica is a pirate theme racing game where you're racing around the island of Jamaica and you're trying to be ideally the first pirate ship to make it or cross the finish line, which is Port Royal. But along the way, you are exploring caves for their secret treasure. Beware, there might be curses in those caves as well. You're also ending up in battles and, 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 and conflict with your other opponent pirate ships and you're rolling dice to resolve conflict and you're looting their their ships when you win the conflict you're looting their ships for whatever goods you they possess that you might be interested in whether it's their their ammo or whether it's their uh, money or if it's their food food is a very important resource to help you get through you know and feed your you know your your um crew as you go around the the entire island of, of jamaica but Coins are important because they are actually added to your victory point total at the end of the game. So, you know, there's um, a lot of value in getting those coins as well. And again, you have your treasures, which you discover at the caves, which are all hidden. So people don't even know how many points you have. You might have gotten three treasures that are amazing and have given you lots of points. Or you might have gotten a few curses that are actually hurting you and maybe, you know, holding you back as far as the victory points are concerned. Very, very neat game. Fun family game. Doesn't take too long, maybe about 45 to 50 minutes, but at the same time just has some neat decision making to, to do because you roll the dice at the beginning of each turn and basically the player who's the active player 
besides the two dice that they roll and gets to place one as the morning action and one as the evening action. And the pips on the die determine how many times you get to do your morning action and how many times you get to do your evening action. And then the cards you play are two-sided and one side indicates what you can do on the morning action if you play it and what you could do on the evening action as you play it. And managing that hand of cards that you have and you only have about three cards in your hand at a time, so you have uh, just enough decisions to make you feel like you have freedom of choice, but at the same time, not as many as you would like in some particular moments. And managing those decisions are the key to the game. And also, it's kind of like programming in a sense, because one of the things that you do is you move your ship the indicated amount of spaces that is on the pip of the die, but... You're doing this in anticipation because everybody plays on every die roll, right? And then we reveal the cards one by one and you end up in a spot that, yes, you knew you were going to get there, but you were hopeful that one of your opponents wasn't going to get to that spot as well. But you couldn't anticipate whether or not, A, they even had that card that got them there in their hand and B, that they would be willing to make that move. So you get caught by surprise, you end up in a forced battle, a forced conflict that you were not anticipating and that you were not prepared for, and you're just like, my goodness. So it creates lots of little silly, fun opportunities and, you know, OMG moments throughout the game. And that is my number seven Bruno Cathala game of all time, Jamaica. Now we move on to my number six, and it is Mission Red Planet, which again is a co-design with Bruno Faduti. And this is a, you know, game based on colonizing Mars. Um, it's a area control game. But what's interesting, it has, it has the um, secret, well, not so secret, but the character selection mechanism from Citadels, for those familiar with Citadels, where you have a, before you actually go through the regular um, round, uh, you have a drafting phase where each player secretly drafts a character. And then players in number order, because all the different car characters have a different numerical number, uh, a number, numerical number, a number assigned to them, and you go through the numbers in numerical order. And as you say the number, the player who picked that character card reveals his or her card and gets whatever special ability that that character does, right? Well, this borrows from that mechanism because that Citadel's game was also designed by Bruno Faduti. And basically what it has is each player has their own set of cards, of nine character cards. So you're not drafting them and you're not limited to a certain amount of cards because an opponent might have taken a card you were interested in. No, you have all your cards there. But you're basically going to play each of those nine rolls once. Some of them you might get to play twice in the course of the ten rounds of the game. And each of these cards basically let you, um, they let you occupy different parts of Mars, or they let you do different things that help you manipulate your objective of controlling different areas in Mars or in the moon of Mars. And, and it's very, very neat. But the cool thing about this game, I like Area Majority. For those who've watched my videos before, they know that Area Control or Area Majority is one of my favorite mechanisms. But the really cool thing about this game is that you each player has a hidden mission to start the game with. And this hidden mission, if you accomplish it, gets you a certain amount of points. And the mission could be anything from occupying a certain amount of regions in Mars to accruing a certain type of resource from the planets in Mars, right? And if you do these things you can get bonus points. But your opponents, they don't know what your mission cards are. The more you play the game, the more you can try to deduce and maybe speculate as to what your opponents have as their missions and maybe play accordingly. But you still never know until the game comes to its end. Also, you have some cards called event cards. And these events are placed on the outer edges of the, of the planet Mars and the different regions on the outer edges. And basically, these cards can either bring some positive benefit to a player who has control of that region, or maybe even a negative uh, detrimental effect to a player who controls the region. And again, you don't know, so sometimes seeing those cards underneath a region might scare you away. And even though you initially wanted to have the majority in that region, you might be discouraged because you're afraid of what potential consequence can be on the other side of the card. And again, these cards 
also don't get revealed until the later part of the game. So you tally up your points, which are basically based on all the different resources that you, um, you know, garnered from the different regions of the planet based on having majority or secondary. Um, actually, not secondary in this game. You, you need to have majority or tied for majority to benefit and score the points for the different regions, which are their resources. And that's basically the bulk of your points. But again, the missions and some of these other event cards, they throw a little monkey wrench into your plans and might you know, show an end game result that you were not ready for. And I find that to be really neat, unexpected, a game that has you literally holding your breath to see what the outcome is until the end of the game, I think is really, really neat. And sometimes it's hard to accomplish it, but by having these secret missions, it gets the job done. My number six Bruna Cathala game of all time, Mission Red Planet. And now we move on to my number five, and that is Dice Town. And this is also a dual or joint design project with Ludovic Mablanc. And this is a Wild West themed game where each player has five dice, which are basically representing their poker hand. Each side of the dice has a different card from your poker hand. And you're going through the town of Dice Town, which is separated into, you know, six or seven different, you know, buildings that get you different benefits if you are the player who wins a certain poker hand there by having the most, you know, uh, spades, by having the most hearts, by having the most jacks, by having the most queens, by having the most kings, and finally, by having the best overall poker hand. So for any, you know, uh, poker game aficionados or people who really, really like poker, this could be a good game for you, a good transition into the board game hobby for you. But yeah, you go through all these different regions and then you score a certain benefit. And some of these places, they allow you to get money. Some of them allow you to get gold nuggets. Others allow you to draw cards from a deck that gives you special abilities or points. Others let you gra get, grab uh, property cards, which are also worth a different amount of points ranging from one through five. Some of them make you the sheriff, which gives you the right to break ties throughout the game and also sometimes gets you a little bit of bribery money uh, thrown your way and finally gives you five points at the end of the game if you're able to hold on to the sheriff. Now, I've been playing with the Wild West expansion lately and basically it's a great expansion because it adds a second option to each of the different buildings so that if you are the first place person in that, in that different building, you can choose which of the two options you're more interested in on that specific turn. But also, if you're the second place person in that building, which sometimes you're frustrated with in the base game, you, you, there's nothing you could do. But with the expansion, if you're the second place person, you get to pick the alternative option that the first place person left behind that they, uh, that they did not choose. So again, that creates for a richer, more robust economy because so many good things are happening some players may not like that i do appreciate the decisions that it adds it adds a, a certain an additional layer of decision making which i always appreciate in games it does add a little bit of length to the gameplay so it's not a must play expansion but it's a must have and you do when you feel when you feel up for maybe an additional 15 minutes added or maybe 10 to 15 minutes added to your dice town game it's worth throwing in. So this is my number six, Wild West theme, Bruno Cathala, board game of all time, Dice Town. And now we move on to my number four. And all of these games rank very highly on my personal top 50 board games of all time. If you have not watched my top 50 board games of all time, please, as soon as you're done with this video, click on the link below and at least add it to your watch list. So my number four game, is another co-design, and this is the brainchild of Antoine Boza, really, but Bruno Cathala worked along with him to create Seven Wonders Duel. And because Antoine Boza did not produce him this game on his own, it leads me to believe that Bruno Cathala had a lot to do with the design of this game. And this is basically a two-player game of Seven Wonders. Basically, Seven Wonders is a civilization-themed game where players are going through three rounds or three ages and trying to improve their civilizations in about seven different categories of scoring, right? All seven different categories of civilization. But Seven Wonders, which is, again, one of my favorite board games of all time, has a pick-and-pass card drafting mechanism, which can only work 
when you're playing with three or more players. However, Seven Wonders Duel has taken away the pick and pass drafting and has created a static draft, right? Where you have a lineup of cards and you draft from there. But what's interesting is you have all the cards laid out and set up before you as the game begins. And each different age has the lineup that is basically resembling some sort of ancient architectural structure, right? You could, in the first round, it's like a pyramid. In the second round, it's like a reverse pyramid. In the third round, it's some sort of, you know, temple with pillars. I'm not sure. But the point is, the cards are lined up, and each row is either completely visible or completely hidden by being face down. So you can anticipate some of the f upcoming rounds or some of the upcoming cards but there's also some other cards that you have no idea what's there. And sometimes you get yourself into a little bit of a tug of war where you don't pick a card that you might be interested in because by picking that card, you uncover a card that was previously covered and therefore unavailable to your opponent. You uncover it, make it available, and that card may be something that your opponent desperately wanted or a card that would be totally detrimental to your outcomes if you allowed it in the hands of your of opponent. So sometimes you might have to pass on a really good card that you wanted and get something else and hope that your opponent grabs that card, thus unoccupying the other card that you can snatch away from him or her. Really, really cool game. Really quick, just like Seven Wonders. Probably even quicker than Seven Wonders. Only two players. Takes about half an hour. Gives you that nice feel of Seven Wonders. If you like the theme, if you like some of the symbols and the different scoring options, this does it as well. However, it does give a little bit more value to military than the original Seven Wonders did, which I actually credit this game for because military sometimes does feel like the forgotten stepchild in, in regular Seven Wonders. It sometimes feels like the most redundant of the seven categories and the least beneficial. But in this game, military has a lot of value. It's very thematic in a way. If you just let your opponents you know, dominate you militarily speaking, you're going to lose. You're not going to be the strongest civilization, right? But if you can at least keep toe-to-toe -to -toe with their military, at least that can hold them off and you can find other ways of being the more successful civilization. So that is my number four, Seven Wonders Duel. And now we move to the top three. And I absolutely love these games. And my number three, Bruna Cathala game, is so close to being my number two. And I think that as I play it more and I play it in ideal circumstances, and I'll get to more of that soon, I think it can very well pass my number two. My number three Bruno Cathala game of all time is Cyclades or Cyclades, which is a joint project, a dual design along with, again, Ludovic Mablanc and published by Matago Games. And this game is basically a Greek mythology-themed area control combat game that involves, you know, auctioning for the different gods that you can gain influence over. It involves city building, where you're building different parts of your metropolis that ultimately culminate into a metropolis. And basically, that is how you win. You score a certain amount of metropolis and... You build enough metropolis and that triggers the end game. It's two metropolis in a three or more player game. In a two player game, it's only it's three metropolis. You have to build one more. But it's so cool because you're trying to find the right balance of how to utilize the different gods because each of the gods give you a different benefit. And if you complete and neglect one, you might find yourself you know, falling behind. So you kind of want to use all of them. They all have their value in different ways. The base game comes with four different gods plus a fifth automatic god, which is always there, Apollo. You're kind of shuffling the different gods depending on the rounds. Here's the thing about this game. I love this game. First of all, I have not played any of its expansions. I do own a good amount of them, but I still haven't thrown them to the table. I'm having enough fun with the base game. I've heard a couple people complain about their base game and find it a little bit anticlimactic. I guess because I don't look at this as, you know, a true full hybrid, even though there is some hybrid elements of Ameritrash and Euro, I still see it as more of a Euro game. I guess because of that, I'm not as turned off by what some people would define as anticlimactic. But what keeps this game actually from being my number two, or maybe even my possibly my number one, is the fact that I mostly play this with two players. And this, like any other 
civilization or area majority, area control type of game is best with three or more players. I've only played this with three players two times, I think. And I've never played with four players. And the thing is, this is not in the wheelhouse of many of the people that I game with. And because of that, it doesn't get to the table as often. And it also doesn't get to the table in those scenarios, those two, those three or more player settings. I do have hopes of sometime in the near future teaching this to my nephews and my niece. And that might be a setting in which I could get it to the table with multiple people. Because I truly feel that that's where this game shines. It's still a very good game. I like the mechanism so much that even in a two-player game, I ignore all of its setbacks and its shortcomings in a two-player version because I still like the rich Greek theme and the nice mechanisms of the game. But I am dying to play this more as a three- or four-player experience, and I truly feel that as I play this game more in those settings... This game has a very, very good chance of climbing. And I'm sure that the expansion content will add to the experience of the game. I'm not knocking the expansion content. I'm just saying it is still a great game to me, even without the expansions. And that is my number three, Cyclades or Cyclades. Now we move on to my number two game of all time by Bruno Cathala, which might be overtaken by Cyclades sometime in the future. And that is Shadows Over Camelot which is published by Days of Wonder. And again, it's a joint design with Sergei or Sergei Laget or Sergei Leger. Ser Sergei Leger, something like that, French names. So this is a King Arthur themed cooperative game where each player takes on either King Arthur or one of his Knights of the Round Table. And each character gives you a different special ability that makes you different than all the other players in the game. And you're going on different quests. And there's like six or seven different quests all going on at the same time. And this is one of those cooperative games that's actually better with more people. It plays up to seven people with the base game. And not only is it better gameplay-wise, but it's actually easier the more people. Some cooperative games tend to be harder to win in higher player counts. This game is better because you have so many quests you're trying to accomplish that the more people you have to play the game, the more you could spread your efforts across the different quests and try to accomplish them. Because every time you successfully accomplish a quest, you get a white sword or maybe two or three white swords even, depending on the quest and the difficulty of the quest, and you get to place it on the round table. But every time you fail to accomplish a quest, you get a black or multiple black swords placed on the round table. And once the round table's 12 spots are filled, if half or more than half of these swords are black, the players lost the game. If at least seven out of the 12 swords are white, then the players won the game. Now what's neat about this game is it has a possibility of a traitor. It was the first cooperative game to introduce this traitor mechanism, but it makes it optional, which I think is neat. And I know a lot of people actually rule out the possibility and make it a, a must have, a guarantee that there's gonna be a traitor. But I like the idea of there not being a traitor because it's so cool to play a game speculating and it kind of holds you back from accusing people because you could officially accuse people in this game it holds you back from accusing people because you know that there may not be a single traitor and that a person might just be acting suspiciously or at least you're interpreting it from your perspective because of your own paranoia that they're acting suspiciously suspiciously but they might not be a traitor and you might not want to risk you know trying to accuse them getting a black sword if you accuse someone falsely and just sowing discord among the team when you should be working together towards an objective. But what if a player is indeed a, a traitor? Really, really cool game. Like the King Arthur flavor. Love the production quality. The board is gorgeous. The cards are beautiful. The little miniatures. You have little miniatures for your character. You have little um, miniature pieces for some of the different, um, you know, warring tribes. You got the Picts and the Saxons. You got some nice miniature plastic pieces for some of the relics that you're trying to get. You know, you have um, Excalibur sword and you have the Holy Grail and you have Sir Lancelot's armor and all these things are represented by these nice little small plastic uh, miniatures. Really great production quality, fun game. Oh man, it's just a great experience. But I do see how Cyclades or Cyclades, you know, is, uh, you know, catching up and um, 
you know, smalling, uh, smalling. It's it, it's it's closing in, closing the gap on this game, and that is my number two Bruno Cazala game of all time, Shadows Over Camelot. And now, my number one, and this is many people's number one Bruno Cazala game, and how appropriate that after a series of many co-designs of Bruno Cazala, that my number one be a pure Cathala where he and he alone is the only designer that worked on this game and that is Five Tribes. This is the number one ranked Bruna Cathala game. Actually no, I think Seven Wonders Duel. But it's definitely the number one ranked of his solo designs on BoardGameGeek.com. This is published by Days of Wonder, just like Shadows Over Camelot. Amazing, beautiful components, beautiful artwork, the pieces, the cards, the meeples, the tiles, the coins, the little wooden camels, and the little wooden um, oasis trees. Oh my gosh. This are all beautiful, beautiful components. This is a game that uses the Moncala mechanism where you're basically grabbing a group of items, in this case, colored meeples, different colored meeples, and you're moving it across the board, but you can only move it equal to the amount of spaces you can only move it a certain amount of spaces equal to the amount of meeples that are on the starting tile that you're grabbing from. So if you grab four tile, four meeples from the starting tile, you can move them along four spaces. And on each space, you're dropping off one of those four meeples. But the key is that that final meeple that you're dropping off has to end up on a space where you already it already has meeples or at least one meeple of that same color that you're dropping off. And when you do that, you collect not only that one meeple that you dropped off, but all the other meeples on that tile that share the same color. And each of the different colored meeples, there's five different colored meeples, represents a different person in the Arabian world. And these different people give you different benefits or different ways of scoring points. But not only do you get the benefits of the different meeples, that tile that you landed on has a specific benefit that is unique to that tile and then you get to capitalize on that benefit so there's a little bit of a point salad feel in this game because there's so many ways of racking up points you're also trying to buy gins or genies that give you different one-time or sometimes permanent abilities plus they give you scoring points at the end of the game you're trying to you know accrue different resources that if you turn in a set of of different types of resources the more resources you have the more exponential value they have which could give you coins during the game that you could use and at the end of the game counts towards points. Also, each round has a bidding um, a, a bidding round for turn order. So it's kind of like El Grande in that sense. It's kind of like some other Bruna Cathala games like uh, Kiklati's where you're bidding for turn order. And so you've got to use your money. Your money is going to be points at the end of the game, but you kind of utilize it wisely because... If you can get yourself the turn order that you're seeking in that current round, then you can optimize your choices and basically, let's say you closed one round, you saw a move that you really wanted to do, you really want to win the auction next round so that you can get to do that move before someone else. Now, this game does have, especially early on in the game, thousands upon thousands of options as to what you can do with each of your individual moves. So it can lend itself to analysis paralysis. Now, I've only played this game with two of my casual gamer friends. I haven't introduced it to my wife Lily yet, but it's definitely, you know, lined up for some time in the near future. But this game can lend itself to analysis paralysis. But honestly speaking, I have to commend the people I've played with. We have not fallen prey to that. We've been pretty quick towards the end of the game as the decisions become a little bit more important and a little bit more crucial. And you also have less options. We tend to spend a little bit more time in our decisions by the end of the game. But early on in the game, we are quick about it. And very pragmatic and practical but this game is a fun game feels different every single time and again beautiful production quality this is my number one Bruno Cathala game of all time five tribes and that my friends is my top 10 Bruno Cathala games ever and Bruno Cathala again one of my favorite designers I appreciate every single one of these games you know Game of Thrones Hand of a King not quite that much, but all these other games, love them, can play them several times a week if I had to. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much for spending some time watching me here, share my top 10 Bruno Cathala games. Thank you so much for joining us here at When Harry Met Board Games. 
please hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. What's it going to hurt? Anyways, thank you so much. This is Harry saying take care. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.